going to show you how to make this simple ring with the crown setting. This is an ideal project if you're a hobby jeweler wanting to try commercial jewellery skills. And you can see that the techniques learnt in this will serve you well if you want to go into training and learn how to make solitaire rings. Check it out. For this project I'm using a piece of half round silver wire this is 2.6 mil wide by 1.6 mil thick. Uh, you can use slightly larger if you want. Uh, the length of this at the moment is 65 millimeters long, which is too long for the finger size I want. And I'm going to show you a way of making a ring to the right size without doing your calculations. I've also got a, a piece of sheet that is 1 mil thick. It's 6 mil wide and it's 20 mil long. Now I've done a calculation for this by this is the stone I'm using, it's a 6 mil round CZ so I've taken the diameter of the stone, I've times it by pi, that's 3.14 and added the thickness to it. So that's given me a fraction under 20 mil but uh, 20 mil is good enough. I'm going to show you two ways of making a uh, standard collet um, just in case you haven't got a collet block so I'll show you how to use the collet block for it and then I'll show you how to use a dapping set to make the collet. So make sure that you anneal the silver first. I'm using a Smith mini torch to do my soldering and annealing but you can use an orca torch for this project. So place your silver on charcoal if you've got it, turn your light off and you can see the colour change so you just want it to go to cherry red and then take the flame away and it should be a neutral flame so not too hissy. So now as soon as the uh, brightness has gone out of the silver and it turns a little bit black like that, I'll quench it and pickle it. Now if you're used to uh, doing your calculations to make the ring uh, you can do, just do that, bring the ends together and solder it, but um, I want to show you a nice quick way of making a ring to a nominated size. So the size I'll nominate for this is size N. I've got my size stick ready and I'm using my half round pliers with the round part facing away. And I'm just pushing the silver strip away and as I do that, I'm just testing the, the shape of the curve on my ring stick at least two sizes smaller than the nominated size. That'll make sense to you in a minute. So just move your pliers down a little and then try again. So we're around about size L, making sure it fits nicely onto that. Let's so just tighten it up a little bit. So we'll just grip the end turn it and now move the pliers down and you'll get a perfect ring shape but we can knock it into shape later on. Now as you come to the end, cross it over. This is actually a good few sizes smaller so it works even better. Do that and make sure that the two ends are curved properly and not too straight. So you can see that it's not perfectly round, but now I'll push it up the ring stick, bend it a little bit further towards the end. just about half a size under the size I'm after and you can see it's not too bad there's a couple of gaps here and there but um, we'll knock those out I did flatten the end and just with a scalpel just mark along on the end that you're going to cut so now I'm just going to push it up further so that when I cut through that it's not going to cut into the other end Cut it perfectly square so you don't have to file too much off. Put 
pile both ends. Now cross it over and hold it with your parallel pliers and just line it up. And there should be tension in that joint now. There's also a little bit of a gap. You can just see that gap there. Now this joint's going to be opened up later on to stop the setting in. So a perfect joint is not necessary, but it's good practice to get your joints as perfect as possible. Okay, so that's lined up nicely. So I'll solder it. A little bit of flux on the joint, a bit of flux on the solder. The grade of solder doesn't really matter, but uh, again, it's good practice to start always soldering with hard solder. I use my solder pick to pick the molten solder up. I've got a neutral flame, which means as much gas as air. And this minimizes the chance of a fire scale on the silver as well, so it doesn't totally eliminate scale but it does lessen the chance. Now if you haven't annealed the ring before doing this then there's a chance it will move around a little bit so you need to relax the metal by annealing it and that will ensure that the joint stays closed. So the solder's through. Again wait until the colour goes quench and pickle. Just remove any solder from the inside of the ring and stick it on your mandrel and hopefully there's not much of a gap here and there to get rid of but just tap it into a perfect round shape. I like to use a nylon mallet to do this but if, if you've just got a hide mallet that's fine. Still a bit of a gap there so just tap it across the mandrel side of the ring and that helps to close it. So now the ring is pretty much done and it's a fraction over the size that I nominated which doesn't matter so if your size is a little bit up or down on what you want we can sort that out later because we need to take a section out when we slot the setting in. So for the setting you need to square off the ends so if you're if you've not got a keen eye for what's square and what's not, then use a set square. And it needs to also be square this way as well, so it should form a nice letter T when you put your file across it. So square off both ends. Okay, make sure it is annealed. You need a little bit of strength for this. And it's a good idea to practice this technique first in brass or copper. And uh, when you're comfortable then move on to your silver ring. So clamp the very end with a pair of round nose pliers and again push the metal. You can see I'm doing a pushing the metal and not twisting the pliers so much. So don't try and go all the way around in one hit because it's very hard to uh, to curve the other end otherwise. So again, grip the other end and push. Get a nice curve on the end so it should look something like that. And then if you're struggling to move it anymore, just use the side of your bench peg. Bring the ends together and a pair of chain nose pliers. Squeeze it together. What I'm going to have to do is run a saw blade through the joint to make sure it's perfectly 
together without any gaps. So you can see that there's a gap there. I'll just run my saw blade through it now. And the saw blades I generally use are 4 0. So you should be okay with a 2 0 if that's what you're using. When you start working on finer jewellery, then uh, you'll find that 4.0 is going to do most of the work. So the joint's clean and it's square, so it should meet up. So with your chain nose pliers, just tease the joint together. If the silver is annealed, then it should stay in place. But if it's work hard, it'll keep springing. There we go, we've got the joint nice and tight. So I'll flux that and we'll hard solder it. And I'll also show you a way of tightening that joint just in case you can't get it tight enough. So I've got my solder there, it's been fluxed. Um, if you're used to just laying your solder on the joints, then just do it that way. Uh, but be prepared to move it up or down to keep it on the joint because as the uh, flux um, melts or evaporates then it can flick the solder around so it needs to um, land right on the joint so I'll just place mine on and allow it to run through check the inside of the setting and, and see that the solder's run on the inside as well now if you've got a little bit of a gap or the solder's just dipping in there a little bit it means that the, um, the joint isn't closed up enough so um, what I want to show you is what not to do first so these are spring loaded solder tweezers and you shouldn't hold it like that and solder like that because it will just collapse with the um, tension that you've applied so you can put the tension in there manually by holding it with your solder tweezers and again practice this technique with brass first and I'm just pressing down on the solder I'll just get rid of that solder there and just bringing it back to soldering temperature and put a little bit of force on it now and you can see that the gap closed up perfectly so that is now ready for quenching and pickling and then we're going to form it. Now the first way I'm going to show you is using a collet block or sometimes known as a bezel block and this is obviously the round shape and the angle of the setting walls is 17 degrees so make sure if you are going to get one it says 17 degrees on it and that 17 degrees is uh, the angle from the axis point of the setting to the setting wall. So that's where I'm at with my stone against the setting and the stone should be sat on top of the setting and not going inside. So if you're getting serious about making jewellery then you'll find that this will be a great investment. You get diff different shapes as well but start off with a round and don't use the punch, this is the punch part of the uh, collet block. Just hammer into a hole that it fits into and then move down and hammer again. And then before we go into the next one, I'm just going to turn it upside down and just turn the top end in a little bit because if I don't do that, then you'll get a, a little fold coming over the edge of the collet block. So just squeeze it in nice and nicely bit like that. And now we can force it into the next one. Until you make contact with the collet block and place your setting on top or your stone on top and you can see that once I use the punch it's just going to open up enough for the stone to sit where it should. So it's only at the last stage that you need to use the punch. So that's how simple it is to make a setting 
and the stone should be sat onto it like that. If you're starting to get into jewellery making as a hobby then there's a good chance that you've bought yourself a doming block and punches so I'm going to show you how to make a setting using that. Now it's, again it's a good idea to practice in copper first until you get the technique right but again we're going to find a hole that the setting fits into and give it a good firm whack and it should start bringing the setting in at the bottom it's also going to shorten it a little bit so now I'll use my doming punch and just find one that's not quite going inside but um, it's just contact in the inside edge of the setting. Okay, you can see it's slightly rounded, but uh, we'll work on that a little bit more. Now you can see that the uh, setting at the top has opened up a little bit so I'm just going to close it in a fraction and it's a good idea to anneal this as well at this stage um, just check it out it started to bend in a little bit more the stones now sat on top where I want it it shortened it a fraction but uh, that should be fine to make a setting as long as it's tapered in at the bottom uh, we can file the rest of the shape into it your setting will no doubt have some uh, dents and scratches in it so we'll file those off now and just check the uh, form of the setting make sure that it's um, equally tapered all around uh, if it's not, it means that you've struck the setting slightly off angle in the block, so more practice is, is required if that, that's the case. So now I'll get rid of the tool damage. And get rid of the file marks. So this is 400 grit emery paper. Well, the top of the setting perfectly flat and just check that the bottom is parallel to the top you can always confirm that by using your vernier gauge and if there's any gaps around the bottom as you do that then just file to the side where it's contacting the gauge and that will ensure that it is perfectly parallel now I'm just going to show you how it looks with the stone on top it should be sat on top of the setting like that uh, around about covering around about a third of the thickness of the metal um, so now that's ready for attachment to the uh, to the shank and to do that what I like to do when I'm making jewelry is keep my solder joints all together wherever possible so what that means is the solder joint on the setting, which I can see from the inside, it's got a mark there, so it's there. I'm just going to mark that because that is going to be soldered to the shank. So I'll just put a little nick there so I don't lose it. Now place your saw blade right across the bottom and with one eye closed you should be able to see if that is perfectly through the middle of the bottom of the setting. When you're happy about that, just cut into it and you can cut a mill or two into the setting. And I'll find a three square needle file and I'm just going to widen that cut. Again you should just stop and check to make sure that the file is perfectly through the centre of the bottom of the setting. If you don't get that right, then the setting is going to be soldered offline, so um, make sure you check. Now what we're aiming to do here is copy the profile of the shank onto the setting. So there's a couple of obvious ways of doing that. First of all, you can use your 
round needle file nice and easy and that will create a similar profile we also need to be able to shape it on the inside of the setting because the ring is round it's got to fit perfectly into the joint so I've got a round burr here now in an ideal world you'll have every single size of round burr it's very unlikely you will this one is a 2.3 mil round burr and the size of the shank is 2.6 so what it means is I've just got to move it around to open it up a little bit once I've cut into the setting again keeping it perfectly through the middle so we'll do that on both sides and I'm taking a little bit more off the inside of the setting to allow for the shape of the ring. So you can see I need to just move it around a little bit more. So you need a really firm grip of your handpiece. And you can see how I'm contacting my other hand and the setting. So everything is pretty firm and tight together. If that wasn't the case then as you get to this side of the setting it will grip and it will rip around the setting so just watch for that just on that edge there it's starting to grip a little bit but with a good firm holding technique you should be okay with that. So what we don't want to do is overcut it as well. Because if we do that, then we're going to have gaps in it. And I hate filling gaps with solder. Solder is for fixing, not for filling. So we just need to go a little bit wider. Take a little bit more on the inside there. And keep checking. You can see how it's tightening up quite nicely there. We also need to take it down low enough that the setting, when you look at it side on like that, it's broken through the bottom of the shank. So I still need to cut plenty more out. And the handpiece I'm using is part of a machine called a uh, micromotor which is an alternative to a pendant drill. Really good for doing work like this and for stone setting as well. Keep going, keep it really tight like that. Get the other side the same, and we should be there. And before we attach the setting to the shank, just run some emery paper over it. That'll ensure that it's clean before it's attached. Now, the way I've cut the under part of the setting, it's it should just grip at these points here and be very careful when you're burring out the bottom part that you don't take off this very corner here because that will leave a gap because as you can see the profile of the ring means that it's straight at the sides there so what that means is I've got to really force it into place and it might even click in which would be really nice if it does now the solder joint is going at the bottom uh, because I've worked hard on this, if I heat that up when I put it uh, onto the setting, uh, as I said, I like to keep my joints together, but in this case, if that was there and I heated it up and the solder started to sweat, then because of the tension it would open the joint. So the joint for this is going at the bottom of the shank. And I'm going to try and force it in. I might need to do a little bit more of a tweak. You see it's going in there, but it's just caught on the inside edge there which is good in this case because it means it's not going to have any gaps so just because it's a minimal amount I'm just going to use my file okay there we go so that's how it should look so the setting has actually gone through the bottom of the shank there so once I file that it will all marry up together and look great and that's almost holding itself in place as well. 
So I'm just checking again and I've got a little bit of a gap there that I'm just going to work on to get rid of. Okay, now that fits really nicely on uh, both shoulders there. So I'm quite happy with that. I'm going to flux it and uh, I'm going to show you, I'll flux this side as well, just show you a good pair of tweezers for holding this together um, whilst we solder it. And that's these here, you can see that's parts for the shank and that's for the setting and makes life very easy for soldering settings onto shanks. Uh, so these are just called ring holding soldering tweezers I believe, so uh, if you want to buy those they're not very expensive, but can't assume you've got those, so and we'll just do it by balancing it and being prepared to move the shank into place as I need to. Sorry, my hands are in the way, I'm just making sure I've got enough flux on it. So that's holding okay. Got my solder there with a little bit extra if I need to just add a bit more once it's soldered. And I'm using medium grade solder. It is the last solder joint, so uh, you can use easy. I just like to leave uh, easy out when I can so it gives a an option for future repairs. Not that many jewelers think that far ahead. So again I like to just um, pick the solder up as I go and uh, place it when it's molten. So now I've soldered one side of the setting I can lift it up and just turn it to make sure that the setting forms a perfect T with the shank. As you can see that looks pretty good. Also check this way as well to make sure I've got that angle correct, everything's touching and lined up properly. So now I'm going to apply solder on the other side, um, otherwise the joint uh, might sweat and might move. So a little bit of solder on the other side and I'm just going to change the shape of the flame, just add a little bit more gas and there we go, the solder's run but I can see I need a bit more so I'm going back to the other side now put my little molten ball of solder on the other side get ready to move it if I need to that's fine, and a last bit on this side and we should be good Okay, again, lift it up, check, make sure the solders run all around. There we go, and on the other side as well. All good, so now quench and pickle. So it looks pretty ugly in there at the moment, but um, just put fire to that and burr it through, and it'll, it'll look pretty good. Okay, now I'll burr that the centre out with the same round burr I used earlier uh, from the inside, being careful to keep it right on track. Yeah, there are many, many ways to do the same thing as you probably found with jewellery. Uh, they say there's many ways to skin a cat. I'll go from the inside now. And uh, I've been teaching students face to face for over 12 years now. And, found a project like this is really good for um, hobby jewellers or someone who's done a jewellery course and wants to try a different something with a challenge or something more commercial without getting too frustrated. So you could see how simple it was to attach the set to the shank. 
and when I do the other setting, this one, I'm going to do it in a slightly different way. So now I've broken through, and I'm going to whirl the burr around, make it perfectly round underneath. I've got this larger burr burr off, tidy the inside with. I just want to scrape the inside a little bit, I don't want to take too much metal off, but when it comes to the top rim you'll see that it's got a little fold uh, on it that's kind of folded into the setting from when I hammered it. So I'll just um, get rid of that, make sure it, it's smooth with the inside. You can see that little step there, so I just want to blend that in, whirl it around. Whatever you do, don't open it too much that the uh, stone drops in. So. so yeah, the stone still sits nicely on top of the setting. clean it, ready for the cut work to be done. This is where it gets exciting. Now earlier when I made the shank I did say that the quality of the joint wasn't that important um, because I was going to open it up. Now that's the way I'm going to be doing the other setting, the one that I did in the collet block. So just uh, take it back to the point where I did say all that and uh, disregard it if you're doing this particular uh, ring then make sure it, the joint is perfect and uh, hard soldered as well. And so just every clean around the solder or the shoulders there just wrap a bit of emery this is 800 emery around a needle file and you can get right into the crease there. And you should always cross emery, so that means don't stay in the same direction because you just form lines. When it comes to polishing you'll see those lines, so just try and cross the direction as much as you can. It's a little bit awkward in some places, but if you're doing like the side of the shank like that, it's quite easy. You can just go one direction then change the direction like that. Yeah, if you were going to uh, sell this once you've made it, then make sure you stamp it with the appropriate hallmark. Of course, if you, if you live in England, you know that you need to send it to the assay office to be hallmarked. In Australia, we don't uh, have that rule. We have to stamp our own jewelry. And this is probably a split mandrel. It's just a mandrel that goes in your hand piece with a split in it I suppose it's uh, got that uh, split going through it so you can slot a piece of emery paper in there and clean the inside of rings like that. Again it should be crossed so get a piece of dowling with some emery paper on and cross direction. Now for marking out the claws you could use uh, the template that I show you how to make in stage one of the training. Um, but I like to get students to just check to see how accurate they can do it by eye. So the first thing to do is we need to line the claws up with the shank. So don't just do it randomly. Get your saw blade and just hold your saw blade across the setting making sure with one eye shut that it lines perfectly with the shank. So I'll just show you how I've got that which is tricky to do with the saw frame in the way. Um, so I'll just put a little backwards cut. I'm really taking my time to make sure that it's lined up. So i put a backwards cut there. And again, I'll rest the blade over the setting and just see where it uh, it splits the circle right in half symmetrically. Put a little nick backwards cut that way. I'm also going to make sure that that lines up with the shank as well. So just rest it on like that. And that's 
the marking for the cutout that is so there'll be a claw either side of those little notches so I'm going to firm those up so now you can test how accurate you can mark out the other two claws on both sides so with a permanent marker put two marks in on one side and then the other and just to confirm that you got that right you can just check with your dividers now you can see these are really good precision dividers and if you start to get serious about your training I do recommend that you get a good pair of dividers that come in really handy again especially when it comes to stone setting so I'm putting a little notch in a little scratch and just making sure it all meets up so that was spot on mm -hmm. again so now I'll firm those marks up and uh, for the other setting I'll put eight claws in but I'm um, keeping this nice and simple and now I've set my dividers to around about half the height of the setting probably a fraction just a fraction under as you can see I'll show you the line there you see it there and this will give you a guideline to cut towards. So now take these saw cuts down to that line and you can see I'm angling it to keep it straight so once I hit the line there then I can straighten it. So I like to go to the opposite side when I'm doing this this kind of stuff and it's good practice for when you get to setting stone. So that's where we're at at the moment, so they look like very wide claws, so we're going to make them narrower now by cutting in to those cuts with the three square needle file. So just follow exactly what you did with the saw cut, making sure that the file is kept really square to the work, uh, otherwise you'll find that the angle will lean over one way. and. Uh, be short on the other way so make sure it's perfectly straight as you file and again go to the opposite side and when you're doing this if you work on opposites as well you can do corrections you just keep looking down to see that uh, it is symmetrical as you work and if you find that it's not, then you can just file over one way or the other to make it work. Now it's looking more like a claw setting, but uh, if you find that your claws are too wide or too narrow in places, then just move your file towards the claw to thin it off a bit so they should all be the same with something like that now with your round needle file just file into the gaps being very careful not to run your file right the way along if your file widens out too much so if that's the case you're going to make the uh, claws too narrow so And avoid that. Now you can angle the file, so I'll show you the angle I'm filing at now, it's something like 45 degrees and that will give us a nice uh, reflection from the scalloping or the uh, cuts of the setting. The actual width of the claws should be around about 1.5 millimeters so don't bring them to a point I've seen that plenty of times and um, 
means you've gone too far and you can't really uh, take it back so be very very careful and of course the same thing can be done with a comb burr but um, I'm going to stick to the file for this project Now also be careful not to come in contact with the shank as you do the, um, the filing on the sides. And when you're filing the scallops or the cuts, when you're filing the cut work just where the shoulders are, be very careful not to come in contact with the shank there. And the shape of the claws should be should be angled like that so it's almost like a triangle with the inside cut off a little bit I just want to show you my filing technique I'm twisting the needle file as I'm filing I'm making sure that I run it up the sides of the claws to keep the claws straight. So the sides of the claws here and here should be straight, not bending out or moving up to form a point either. So very important you get that right. Now these cuts have now been filed past the original mark that we first started cutting to. So make sure they're all lined up to the same mark. Uh, which would mean <coughs> these cuts at the shoulders would really dictate how low they're going to go because of the uh, chance of contacting the shank. Now once you've got them all nice and neat, the claws all look the same thickness, then again get some memory paper, wrap it around your needle file and uh, go over the file marks. And once you've gone one direction then give it a little twist like that. It's going to make it easier for polishing. This is just a uh, cotton string I've got tied up by my uh, bench peg and it's really good for getting into nooks and crannies for polishing. So yeah, as you can see it'll do the cut work beautifully. So go around the setting and once you've done that, it's time to give it a polish. Now the polishing compound I use is called Hyphen. It's really good for jewellery, although it's supposed to be a steel polish. Um, now I often get emails uh, sent to me asking about certain lessons, do a, do a lesson on um, how to deal with porosity or how to deal with fire scale and uh, various questions and um, the best thing to do is to go to the search option on the website and just put uh, keywords into that and you'll see uh, from well over a thousand videos and over 700 lessons, full lessons online, so um, a good chance your questions can be answered that way. So there we go, it's all polished. Stick it in the ultrasonic now and uh, we'll take a look. There we have it, polished and ready for setting.